Welcome to FOB TV, the future of business. I want to thank each of you for joining us for the program today. I'm really excited to introduce our guest. Our guest is Dev Mukherjee. He's an adjunct professor and he teaches at the School of Business at DePaul University. He's an executive advisor, consultant, and he has served in executive leadership roles in many different technology companies, including IBM and also as the CEO of Evite. He's also a graduate with an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. Dev, thank you for joining us today. Kevin, thanks very much. And thanks very much for that introduction. I, I assume my mother wrote that for you. <laughs> today we're going to talk about ecosystems and your mother or my yeah your mother can be a part of that ecosystem out there so let's just jump into this conversation today one of the most interesting things i read on your linkedin profile is that you're an expert in french toast now i know that's not the core of what we're going to talk about around <laughs> businesses and ecosystem strategies but French toast? And you talk to me about how does one become an expert in French toast? Well, I, I think it's, uh, it's really two things. Um, you know, first of all, um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, I think it was, said you, you have to spend 10,000 hours doing anything to be an expert. I, I actually think it's more about two things. One, uh, having a definition of what, uh, what high performance is, because experts should be delivering high performance. Uh, wherever they're operating, uh, and then secondly, how you continue to deliver high performance. So, in the uh, the French toast department, uh, my daughter Bren is the arbiter of, uh, of high performance. She tells me if it's if it's good or not. Uh, and then secondly, um, you know, I build a process to get better and better at uh, French toast. Uh, to paraphrase Edison, I uh, I know a hundred ways not to make French toast, and uh, uh, and every time it gets a little bit better. Ah, that's so much fun. I love French toast myself, so I have a keen appreciation from that. Also in my research, Deb, I, I noticed that for your undergrad management class, you were kind of asking, you were running a poll on LinkedIn, and let me see, you were asking your class, what's the most critical ingredient for a successful business? What did you learn from that question, that exercise on LinkedIn? Well, first of all, I, I have to say, um, you know, the fact that you can do something like that, you know, on, on LinkedIn and other platforms to get uh, literally thousands of people to, to give you instant feedback on a, on a Friday night is, uh, is kind of mind blowing in itself. But uh, the, the feedback was fascinating. Uh, more than two thirds of the people responded said that having the, the right people in the right place uh, where it was critical, you know, that was uh, two thirds of the folks. And then um, a much smaller number, you know, talked about strategy, value proposition and, and business model. And only a tiny number, you know, talked about, uh, you know, traditionally what we thought is important, the, 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 the CEO and, and compensation and stuff like that. Uh, but I think this plays very well into our topic for today. What they're really saying is you need talent and you need uh, assets. And uh, and that's what a, an ecosystem delivers to you. But it was uh, it was I appreciate the question. They, it was fascinating to see how quickly people focused on uh, on exactly those points. You know, I had the opportunity for five years to be the leader of a startup in the um, enterprise mobility space when that was kind of the hot theme back in like two thousand two. And I remember wearing almost all the hats in a leadership role. You know, chief sales guy, chief marketing guy, CEO, CFO, when the board wanted me to review the numbers and the investments and what, what was coming out of their investments. And I did not have a team, sufficient team around me uh, helping build that. And so I remember the pain of being able to just, you know, spend 30 minutes on each of those topics each day and was, of course, insufficient for, you know, to get the job done uh, early on. And we had to build that up with talent. So I have a keen appreciation for that. Our core theme and subject today is ecosystem strategy. And uh, TCS did a big report on it. We'll talk a little bit more about that later and get some of your uh, feedback after you've had the opportunity to read it. But I think that 
if you look at, you know, Gartner does their height curve. And I haven't looked at the most recent one, but ecosystems seems like that buzzword has to be at the top of the height curve. Does it deserve that role in your opinion, Dev? I'm sure actually, if we look back, that it's been at the top for a, for a number of years now, you know, platforms of, uh, and ecosystems, and you need a platform to create an ecosystem that have been up there. I think it does deserve it because the ecosystem model because of what it does with uh, with assets and access and the creation of value really is transforming business. You know, th these are, uh, you know, I hate to be cliched, but these are exponential effects on, on what can happen to a, an underlying business. The, the network effect that you get when you get to turn a, a product or a service business uh, into a platform and, and by that creating an ecosystem, uh, you know, drives not only great returns, but also, you know, huge growth because you have this multiplier effect. Oh, that's fascinating. Now, I don't know if your family is like mine, but our entire family plays Wordle. And when you use the term network effect, it just, it, it, it seemed to me that is such a key example of a network effect. You know, Wordle seems to come out of nowhere. Now, everybody, all of our friends, are playing it and then <laughs> we have to keep telling our friends to keep your mouth shut don't tell me the word until i get to it all this kind of fun stuff talk to me about that network effect and how that might play into ecosystems it's a great question we uh we have the uh the wordle bug too the uh the fascinating thing about wordle is how quickly it grew and you're exactly right that this wasn't a uh, a large corporation or and with a huge uh, marketing budget. It's uh, it's one guy uh, who built it for his uh, his partner, and so that that scaling effect from sheer just word of mouth from user to user is uh, is incredible. I, I think though the um, the missed opportunity with Wordle, as uh, as the the New York Times uh, you know, brought it on board, is they didn't turn it into a, a platform. They had they saw. The network effect of all of these uh, users talking to each other and adopting the software, but they didn't turn it into a platform. Turning it into a platform would have meant allowing people to use the Wordle infrastructure to do lots of other Wordles. I mean, if you Google Wordle today, you'll see that there's a, a Wordle for people who like numbers. Um, there are some rude Wordles, which I won't mention the name of. There's a uh, Quirtle uh, that allows you to do four Wordles at the same time, uh, and even a uh, global, um, which is uh, about countries. I imagine if the New York Times had taken the Wordle platform and actually allowed it, allowed all of these people to unleash their creativity in all of the different types of Wordles. There would have been creators uh, driving, uh, you know, people to uh, adding more content to the platform, which would have brought more people in which would have then again brought more content creators in, which would have brought more users in. And so instead, what the New York Times got was a few people who are currently on their platform maybe will come over and use uh, Wordle. And then some of the Wordle users hopefully will become Times subscribers. But that's a lot less than if they'd actually uh, step back and, and they could still do this and say, let's use this platform to, to actually create a, an ecosystem. So uh, a great example um for you know what, what can happen in terms of a, a network effect driving usage um but you know so far at least a missed opportunity in terms of creating an ecosystem man that's fascinating and that's such a poignant example of the difference between somebody just putting up kind of a static product out there for people to use instead of putting a platform out there and inviting both the makers and the consumers to be able to share in that, because I could even think of all the different languages that could be supported, right? A friend of mine from Thailand uh, emailed me uh, the Thai version of uh, Oh, of wow. Um, and, and I think there's even a, a Chinese ideogram version. Uh, so here at TCS, of course, we talk to all kinds of big companies about all kinds of issues. And right now, we're still getting leaders asking us to help them think through what an ecosystem mindset would look like. 
Talk to us about that from your perspective. So I, I, I'm not surprised to, to hear what you said. Uh, you know, for hundreds of years now, you know, the, the corporation has been focused on a, a very hierarchical approach to uh, producing products and, and more recently services. And so uh, top management and all of the structures of the organization are designed to, to do just that. To actually let go and to consider that people outside your organization are going to contribute assets uh, to, and create value that's going to be important to your consumers is really a huge mindset shift. Because if you ask any CEO, what, what's uh, valuable? It's my, my customers and my, my product or service. But you, you know, imagine a Roblox game provider, they provide a, a platform and, and yet, there's really nothing in that platform until someone puts content into it. Top of mind, because I, I saw this last week, that one of their developers, again, doesn't work for, for Roblox, doesn't have a contract even with the, the end users, uh, earned $50 million last year from providing their service on top of, uh, on top of the, the platform. So uh, it doesn't surprise me that, uh, that this is a, a mindset shift, but, but a necessary one. Ah, that's fascinating. Dev, in doing some research prior to our call today, I saw that you used the term multi-sided market in an ecosystem. Can you help us all understand what that means from maybe being a single market, sided market to a multi-sided market in an ecosystem? Sure. All right. it's, a, it's a great question. A single-sided market is what we're most used to and, and what most corporations still today do. You, uh, you buy something uh, or you uh, make something and, or you create a service and you sell it to someone. And it's a, a one-way transaction. The producer creates the value, the consumer gets the value. Uh, a multi-sided market is where uh, you know, both sides are engaged in the, the marketplace and uh, by both being in the marketplace, they, they uh, create value. E eBay is a, a classic example. Um, the, the fact that there are people shopping on eBay for, for stuff uh, pulls more sellers in. The fact that there are more sellers in uh, draws more buyers in. Uh, I may go on to eBay uh, to buy you know, one particular type of, of product, uh, but then actually because I'm there, uh, see lots of uh, other sides of products. Uh, so classically, that's that's how you get started uh, in a in a marketplace. But um, there are a lot lot more ways to to go. Let me stop there. See if you have a follow. -up. Ah, no, that's just brilliant. What a great example setting up that auction. So an auction only happens if you have people contributing and people wanting to bid, and all kinds of uh, examples like that too. So in October of last year, Dev, HFS Research and TCS, where I work, published a report called Hyperconnected Ecosystems, Your Path to New Sources of Business Value. And in that report, 83% of all survey respondents answered that they believe that hyperconnected ecosystems that enable collaboration across multiple organizations with common objectives are essential for meeting their specific business objectives. Does 83% surprise you? No, no. I, I think uh, particularly, and, and you mentioned this, I, I saw in your report, uh, particularly given what we've experienced over the last couple of years, the, the, the light bulb has gone on that we're all already uh, massively uh, interconnected and started to see a lot of these examples where participants in the ecosystem uh, are essential to, to driving a, a lot of value. Manufacturers, or actually I'm seeing with a number of my clients that manufacturers are seeing that if they don't participate in ecosystems, if they don't start to create their own ecosystems, they're actually at risk. Uh, you know, the, the story of uh, Airbnb uh, versus uh, you know, Marriott, Airbnb you know, has no, no assets other than a, a platform, uh, you know, Marriott has all of these uh, hotels, Airbnb, I mean, you know the story. So uh, it's both a, an opportunity and a threat. And the, the pandemic, I think, has brought this home more and more to, to everybody. Oh, that's brilliant. My wife and I are super hosts on Airbnb. 
with a home in the mountains. So yeah, we have some intimate experiences there and it's always worked out well for us. So that's exciting to be actually contributors and, and on that. that. Value for you and, and value for all of your guests and enabled uh, by uh, Airbnb. What, what's fascinating about some of these players is Airbnb is a classic example, match.com in the yeah. dating space, uh, another example. They're so focused on some of these strategies. The first thing that they do out the gate, even faster uh, than normal, uh, you know, regular corporations would do in terms of uh, a normal M&A activity, is they go buy other people in their space. Airbnb bought a whole bunch of uh, companies in the Airbnb space. Match.com bought a bunch of dating sites because they wanted to be able to uh, to control the the experience, and so. Um, you know, a lot of opportunity being created. And the fact that there are so many of these consumer examples, Airbnb, uh, you know, eBay, uh, Uber, uh, I think that's also turning on the, um, the, the light bulb for, for everybody that, you know, either you, you get with the program or someone's going to get you. Ah, that's so interesting. Another of the findings on the report is that the biggest hurdle to establishing business ecosystems in the mindset is the mindset change and alignment of purpose, goals, and incentives across participants. So that's what our respondent said. Here's our biggest challenge. It's just getting that alignment of purpose, goals, incentives across participants. Do you agree with that and why? Yes, I, I, I do agree, uh, particularly for, for larger, more established companies. Uh, the, I, I think Machiavelli you know, said it best you know, in the, the changing order of things. Anybody who wants to propose something new is uh, uh, you know, going to get lukewarm support. And so that mindset shift to say, I'm going to let other people into my hen house is uh, is is tough, tough to forecast, tough to invest in. I I I'll give you another consumer example. In my house, we uh, we have a, a thermostat uh, manufactured by a, a large corporation. Uh, I think they probably think that they're doing great in the platform ecosystem game because I can control the thermostat using Alexa. But that's it. Other than that, it's a closed system, uh, and as as such, actually hard to use because there's not that much innovation going on. As a stark contrast, my garage door opener, which is a much cheaper device, not only can be controlled with Alexa, but actually has an API uh, and a whole uh, host of developers who have integrated the garage door opener into uh, into their offering. And, and as such, two things are true. One, Chamberlain, the garage door opener company, is actually getting a monthly subscription for me for access uh, to their API. Secondly, it's going to be very hard for me to ever uh, change garage door opener uh, product uh, because they're now knitted into my whole home uh, ecosystem. Oh, that's such a great personal example. And yeah, I, <laughs> I, not everybody and not every household could, re con could reconfigure all their systems by changing vendors and having to do that. So I can certainly see the appeal, of just leave what, you know, leave it alone. It works. Right. And, and what's amazing about the, the folks who are doing this well is it just happens. Uh, I mean, for, for you and I, you know, we remember uh, cable TV uh, where, you know, at the, the bottom of the, the cable TV screen, there would be, you know, we've just added BBC America and yeah. it would just be there and then you'd start using it and then they would ask you to subscribe. You know, the same is happening to us at home. You know, it's uh, these things are, you know, Alexa is saying, hey, you know, would you like to control your garage door opener? And you go, sure. And then all of a sudden that becomes the way you, uh, you manage your life. And ah, that's so we're, we're talking about consumer examples, but this is happening in the, uh, the, the business to business world uh, as well. That's why I think it's going to drive forward fast. Oh, yeah. And, do you know, as a company, as you pointed out, you don't, you're not operating in a vacuum. Even if you don't have an ecosystem strategy, it doesn't mean that adjacent competitors or even, or even complementary partners today aren't going to be your competition tomorrow. Um, I, a great example here locally in Boise, Idaho, 
A few years back, our local water utility was purchased by a French company called Suez. And I was just scratching my chin going, what in the world does a French company want with our local water utility? You know, I just didn't see the connection. But moving forward about 10 years, Every day we seem to get another letter from Suez, who owns the water utility, promoting another insurance policy. Cover your water heater, cover any in-house leaks, cover the water pipe from the street to your home from root damage and construction damage. And I mean, the list gets longer and longer every month. So suddenly the water utility is now this big insurance company. And it just keeps growing. I was thinking if you were a local insurance company, you would never expect the water utility to be your competition. I, I think you make a great point, Kevin. Uh, a, a good buddy of mine, when we were at Sloan, uh, he, he worked for a big oil company. He pointed out to me that some of the, the newer companies that were just focused on the data, you know, where is the oil? Not, not just in the ground, but where is it on tanker ships? were actually worth more in terms of valuation uh, percentage than, um, than the people who actually controlled the, uh, the oil. And when I was at Evite, we found that the same thing. You know, Evite's a, a marketplace, or really a platform to, to help guests and, uh, and, and hosts kind of coordinate uh, an event. But the data that we had on, for example, when, you know, who was having a 4th of July party uh, turned out to be incredibly valuable. And, and Victor Cho, who uh, took over from me at Evite, has done a fantastic job of bringing in uh, a lot of manufacturers, a lot of service providers that have complementary offerings for those people who are trying to organize events. And so if you draw the, the ecosystem map, Evite has the platform, but there are many, many people who are productively uh, benefiting from the fact that uh, Evite is providing this organizing capability. That's just such an incredible example there. Um, I've used Evite over the years many, many times and received them from many, many people. Yeah, and I could just imagine the kind of data that they can accumulate and the value it would have to anybody that supports events of just about any kind. What, 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 what's funny is you and I probably, uh, as need to be sexist about this as men we receive a lot of evites but it's many times uh, our wives who are you know organizing these events and uh, I, I was talking to my wife recently about our son's birthday party and she mentioned how much information there is now on evite about how you organize a, a kid's birthday party that is a purposeful activity because that is evite investing in the ecosystem to make sure that my wife is able to organize a great birthday party because if it's a great birthday party, she's going to want to have another birthday party. <laughs> you know, other people are going to hear about that, and you get that uh, kind of network effect. That back to the mindset point you're making. You have to invest in the ecosystem, and that's hard because it's not investing only in ourselves; it's investing in the the success of the ecosystem, which. You know, folks like Apple and Amazon and Google have have either have both done well and, and done badly, even though they're you know probably experts in the space. Wow, oh, that's interesting. So let's talk about the role of blockchain and distributed ledger technologies in ecosystems. You know, I've worked, you spent a lot of time with startups, and it seems like a lot of startups that are suspicious of everyone. You know, everybody's out to get me and they're, they're going to take my ideas. They're going to do this or that. Um, in the world of ecosystems, you might end up with thousands and thousands of participants within that ecosystem. How do you build that level of trust across that kind of organization? So I, I, your blockchain is a great technology to create that uh, trust by uh, being able to distribute uh, the ledger, uh, the the record keeping, and and therefore the control mm -hmm. system across the, uh, the the network, and not just from a technology standpoint, but from all of the stakeholders in the ecosystem, uh, helps you know create a solid foundation uh, for trust. So blockchain definitely a, a great technology, a great enabling technology. The point I would make though is. 
someone still has to tend the garden. You know, the, the ecosystem participants have to work together to, to create value. I think a great example is um, uh, the NBA uh, has uh, invested in producing NFTs, uh, you know, great uh, shots of NBA players' performances. So you can own a, a little bit of, uh, of history. So it's a great idea. Uh, I know that many fans are excited about it. But they focused on, on the product side of it. How do I get the, the, the shot out, which is a great start. But a friend of mine who owns a, a number of these top shots, he has a, a big TV, in, as many do, in his living room. He said to me, I'd like to be able to show my top shots on my TV screen, particularly when you know I have a bunch of friends over. Yeah. And I looked, and you know the NBA and their technology partners have, have done nothing to enable him to, to do that. Now imagine if they had you know, built that technology so he could show his, uh, his trophy NFTs on his TV. What would that do, not only as another service that somebody could sell, uh, but also to, to drive that network effect? Everybody who goes to his house is going to see these NFTs go, I, I want an NFT now. Uh, and so um, you know, definitely an amazing technology, which to your point actually will, uh, will help with trust but, but again, it's foundational. We now need to, to, to actively work and growing the ecosystem on top of the technology platform. That is such an interesting example. I was thinking about buying a masterpiece like a Mona Lisa, but not having the capability of showing it on your wall. We, we should start a, a new TCS business. Yeah, uh, don't tell it. anybody. Let's hold that one close. <laughs> so another question from our survey, 90% well, this is the result, not the question. 90% of respondents believe ecosystems will be even more important in the post-COVID-19 world. What do you think? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I, I think for two reasons uh, that we kind of touched on. One is, um, you know, we now have realized how interconnected all of our activities are. And so this is not a new thing. We now know that we're already interconnected. That's the downside. Let's get some of the uh, the upside. The, the other big thing that uh, I think is going to drive this is uh, is human capital. You know, we've talked a lot about goods and uh, technology platforms and and companies, but human capital. One, one of my favorite platform companies is uh, is Upwork, uh, and they provide, as you know, uh, gig workers mostly to uh, uh, to help solve problems. Your your startup when you were having to be head of sales, head of uh, uh, finance and, and produce all of the slides for your board meetings. Now, if you were you know, starting a, a startup today, as you know, I, I know many people are doing this, you would go to what work and you would get somebody who is an expert in that area to help produce your PowerPoint or help you do your chart of accounts or, or help you do actually some very complicated uh, kind of analytics using machine learning and a lot of other, uh, you know, high technologies. So the, the access not only to capability, the, the, uh, the value that can get created by being part of, a, of an ecosystem uh, and increasingly the access to not only technology and assets, but human capital uh, when you need it, what you, know, what you need when you need it, uh, I think is going to, to drive this uh, you know, faster and faster. So what categories of technology, Deb, do you see are the core components of an ecosystem? Core components that we see already, and, and I, I spent a lot of time on this, is enabling technologies to, to let you put the marketplace together. Those are many of the, the web technologies that we see to, today. Uh, you know, Amazon and, and Google, You've done a fantastic job in providing you know, cloud capability to allow us to, to get uh, you know, new platforms up and running without knowing how many users they're going to be. So you can invent the platform without worrying so much about the infrastructure that you might, might have had to worry about uh, in the past. Second thing we touched on throughout this conversation is, uh, is data. And so tools that allow us to know where to focus our energies in, in driving the ecosystem will be incredibly important. I, I've seen this in countless situations where we're looking at, at data from a, you know, whether it's a video network, a marketing network, 
um, you know, certainly hard, hard goods uh, sales uh, and, and looking at the data to say which of our ecosystem participants are actually most important right now, both on the, the supply side and the demand side. So uh, really two um, you know, big focus areas here. One, uh, understanding cloud technologies to allow you to, to put platforms in place to build up an ecosystem, uh, and then data and analytics capabilities. And this is not just technology, this is the, the know-how, uh, the French toast part of things, to, uh, uh, to really know, um, you know how to look at the data, literally terra and petabytes of data, to, to be able to work out what's really important and help us decide where to focus on our, on our ecosystem strategy. Thank you for sharing that, Deb, because that's you know pulling back the curtains and taking a look at what really happens to make an ecosystem strategy or to utilize it. Let me ask you now to put on your futurist hat, if you would. If we project ourselves forward five years, what do we think is going to be different about the world of ecosystems five years from now? How would we have matured? I think that's a, it's a great question. And I'm actually seeing some of this already happen. We're going to stop talking about ecosystems. We're going to stop talking about platforms and we're going to stop talking about digital. And the reason for that is it's going to be part of everything. You know, today, when we say digital, many companies think of that as the IT department's responsibility. When we say, you know, platforms, they may say the, the same thing. The ecosystems may be, you know, the, uh, the VP of, uh, of partnerships or business development. All of these things that we've just touched on are now going to be part of everybody's job and core to the value proposition that all of us are going to, to have to deliver. The, the question will be not, uh, are you going to uh, invest or look into or work on a, an ecosystem strategy? It will be which ecosystems? Uh, are you a part of, and how are you participating in both growing the value uh, of the ecosystem and uh, and also uh, making sure that you benefit from the, the growth in the ecosystem? As a follow-up question to that, Deb, I was just thinking of these boards that may have a lot of older senior executives that have retired and now serving on the board. For them, this world of ecosystems is, is a really different animal than what they were familiar with. It was all about me, me, me as a company and my personal value. And I'm just wondering how big a speed bump or an obstacle that's going to be for people that didn't have that mindset in the past and are now in decision-making roles. You know, I wonder how much of a problem that's going to be. What do you think? Uh I think it's uh, particularly for the larger corporations um, where people are looking at where markets are going and value is being created, that this is becoming maybe not something that they understand completely, but something that they understand is important. Um, <laughs> it's probably not great, but uh, Apple's fight over the app store all over the world uh, and uh, you know, most notably against Epic Games, uh, has really raised the attention to uh, to to what's going on, you know, behind uh, you know one of our largest companies in the world. You know, where is the the source of uh, of value? Um, you know, as Amazon, you know, reports and talks about uh, the value that they're creating not only in the core business but in in their marketplace activities around um, you know fulfilled by Amazon. And all of those Amazon trucks that we now see showing up with not Amazon products, but other people's products. And, and so many of our manufacturers now opening up their own direct to consumer opportunity uh, operations. I think all of that is really uh, helping people understand in their own personal lives how this actually works and, and why it's so important. And I, I see that today actually driving a lot of interest. The, the, the big issue which you raised as we went through this is is mindset, internal incentives. You know, do I really want to be the, the senior vice president of, of ecosystem in, in a company that has been much more, you know, hierarchical? Uh, and then, you know, how to actually get started and, and think about the, uh, the whole ecosystem from a growth perspective. I love it. 
So, Deb, thank you so much for sharing your insight, your knowledge, your experiences, both personal and professional, uh, with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity.